So, Paul, what is the answer? Do we need uh, new, different strategies in Olympic versus Paralympic athletes? Yes and? No. So I'm going to uh, really take uh, on from uh, Nick's talk on uh, injury and I'm going to show you some of the work that we've been doing in uh, the study that many of you have been involved in. And the best way I've got of, of um, introducing this is putting up a slide which should be known to all of you uh, who are involved in sports medicine and exercise science, and that is Willem van Mechelen's model of uh, developing prevention programs. And P Peter started off today by saying that the Paralympic movement is very young. And therefore, for that reason, we are very young in this four-step procedure that is important in developing all of these uh, prevention programs that we'd like to see. So just to review these steps, the step one is to quantify the problem. And we want to know which of the conditions are important in our Paralympic population and how severe are they. Step two is we want to actually start looking for mechanisms. And mechanisms, uh, we're going to be able to dig deeper and discern something called risk factors. And once we've isolated some risk factors, we can then say, fine, how are we going to now introduce a preventative measure and then keep measuring these same epidemiological variables that we measure and make sure that what we're doing is going to make a difference to our athletes. So although there might have been some studies that had been done early in the 90s regarding injuries in Paralympic athletes, there has been very little with respect to illness in Paralympic athletes with formal studies. So we took the opportunity in London of actually measuring for the first time in an accurate way what happens now with Paralympic illnesses. And uh, this should look familiar to uh, many of you. This is our web interface that we, uh, we uh, instituted in London. We used it again in, again in Sochi. And what will happen is those of you who haven't worked with this interface might get the opportunity in Rio to work with it and input your data. So I want to add my thanks to all of you who have used this interface and continue to assist us collecting these data. This is as much your study as it is our study. So this was the uh, first paper to come out of uh, the analysis of the data, looking at 49,910 athlete days and was published in the uh, BJSM. And essentially it tells this story. Now I've included in those figures some other important information here. And I'm going to go back to injury here because it, it's very interesting that the injury and the illness tell the same story. If we look here at the comparative population, and what I've done is I've lumped together the Summer Olympic Games and the, sum, summer, uh, sorry, and the Winter Olympic Games here. These were uh, data bu published by Tobion uh, Soligard very recently. You can have a look at the injury proportion and the injury rate in number of injuries per 1,000 athlete days. And what you can clearly see here is this bar, these two bars are highest, and this bar here is second. So compared to the Summer Olympics and Winter Olympics, our Summer Paralympics and Winter Paralympics are higher with respect to injury rates and injury proportions. So one of two things could be happening here. Either we are... This is a true scenario, and this is a true population and a true uh, event that we're seeing. Or it could be that the Olympic data is underrepresented. Because the data that we have can't be overrepresented. You can't over uh, put in data into a web uh, server. But what we can see, or can perhaps think about, is the Olympic study is not as technologically advanced as ours. And it really uh, is a paper and pen recording system where you fill in the forms. And we know that the forms aren't always filled in. So we have to take what I'm going to tell you now with a certain pinch of salt in that they might be underrepresented in the Olympic data. 
But here I show you the illness data and look at the illness proportion and illness rate. And again, the Paralympic populations have much higher incidence proportions and, il uh, and incidence rates of illness. So what does that look like? It looks like that the percentage of athletes who get ill at a Summer Paralympics is 15%. 17% at a Winter Paralympics compared to 7 and 8% respectively. So if one assumes that the data are correct and that the, the, the Olympic data is correct, then we have a situation where Paralympic athletes have higher incidences of not only injury but specifically illness as well. So in answering that question is do we need specific strategies it certainly looks that that is the case. So the next question is, well, what kind of strategies do we need? So in order to answer this, we actually had to look at what systems are the team physicians actually reporting are affected in uh, Paralympic athletes. And number one is uh, by far and away the respiratory system, which is the highest. Now, whichever studies that you look at, this is one consistent thing is that if you want to decrease illnesses effectively, target the respiratory illnesses in whatever population that you're going to work with. If you can sort those out, you're going to be doing well. Here we have a different uh, issue when one looks at the Paralympic athletes compared to the Olympic athletes. Skin and subcutaneous tissue is much more of a problem in our Paralympic athletes and the genitourinary system is much more of a problem, obviously, in our Paralympic athletes. So that means that if we're going to target where we want to do our prevention programs, we want to have a prevention program for respiratory, we want to have a prevention program for skin and subcutaneous, and for genitourinary as well. What about the Winter Paralympics? Well, look at this interesting finding, is that the... Uh, number of illnesses uh, that was quite high at 2.7 per thousand athlete days is the eye and adnexa. So the eye takes strain in the winter sports setting. So we need to actually consider protection programs and prevention programs for those conditions as well. So our 2012 findings was that age and gender were not independent predictors of illness in Paralympic uh, athletes, that our illness rates are higher than studies in able-bodied. Respiratory illnesses are the most common, but the non-respiratory illnesses are much more prevalent uh, in the uh, population with impairment. Urinary tract infections are more common than in Olympians, and the skin and subcutaneous tissue, particularly in sitting athletes, namely those with wheelchair basketball, powerlifting, and sitting volleyball. So then we had a look at what sports are going to be the ones that one would want to target. And this is kind of seasonal as well. So uh, one has a look at the equestrian uh, here, which is very high. Uh, and this again was the London data. And we see those marked in red with a high ones with athletics, powerlifting, table tennis, and equestrian. There's only a small number of athletes here, and we know that there was a respiratory tract infection that actually went through a large amount of the confined area where these athletes were staying in. Uh, so that can kind of relate to why we would found outliers. But we certainly have areas where we would want to target, for example, uh, athletic powerlifting and table tennis. So in an attempt to like, dig a little bit further, we followed this up with a study which looked at the illnesses that were recorded on only the web system. So we left out all the data where we were able to get from the polyclinics and we went into these 385 illnesses to discern some further details about those illnesses. And these were our findings. That the groups with the most illnesses were those uh, spinal cord injured uh, athletes. And then, very interesting, quite soon behind them, closely followed by the limb deficient uh, groups. So again, showing you that this limb deficient group comes very strongly not only up on injury, but in illness as well. Then we had the group who were visually impaired and then the rest. 
So what are the various different areas? The skin and subcutaneous, mostly in spinal cord injured. And again, very high in the amputation of limb deficiency. Urinary tract, um, mostly those uh, in the spinal cord injured populations. So I think that uh, to end this presentation, I just want to speak about uh, this very important slide which has important findings. If one looks at the three colors on this particular bar graph, this is looking at all illnesses, all infections, and then all the other different infections that are related. So here's respiratory, skin and subcutaneous, digestive, ear, genitourinary. And the question is we asked here is when do Paralympic athletes report illness to their doctors or their medical staff? Blue is what we would want to see. We're in an environment where we have access to the medical staff very easily. We would want athletes to report within that first 24 hours. Why? Because if the majority of these problems are respiratory related, when do you want to stop them? You want to stop them in the first 24 hours when the person is most infective. So you want to early isolate these athletes and we want to get them away from contact with other athletes and that will reduce the chances of the spread through the team. But what we find is that there is a significant proportion of all illnesses, all infections, and have a look at these, the genitourinary infections are very high, that report either 28 hours or longer afterwards. So what does that mean? It means that we are missing a lot of that contact. We're not educating our athletes to report to the physician early enough. And why does that happen? It's not about finding the physician. We think that in this particular population of patients, they're not complainers. They've learned to live with physical challenge for a long period of time and they're used to sorting out a lot of these problems by themselves. So in the setting we need to actually retrain that they should present early so that we can do something about this. Are those illnesses important? And like we look at time loss injuries, we can look at time loss illnesses as well. And the story here is that these illnesses are not necessarily benign that you, they are something that are sorted out within a day because there is a significant amount, up to 20% of them uh, that you see here that are time loss illnesses as well with respect to uh, the various different systems. I just want to come back to this one here, gerontourinary infections. Why they present late is the athletes sometimes can't feel that they have them. They present to the doctor saying, I don't feel well. I probably have a urinary tract infection. Can we do something about this? The answer is absolutely. And you're going to need to ask uh, Nick when uh, this is over or in the, um, in the question period about how he got that rate so low. Because he put a fantastic program together which dealt with not only prevention of respiratory uh, problems, but he put a very good prevention program together for urinary tract infections. And the take-home message of this slide is that we don't need to be sitting with these large amounts of illnesses in our athletes. They can be brought down significantly. So the take-home messages are that illnesses are common in Paralympic uh, athletes. They've got a high incidence. I didn't show you the data, but they uh, are the same in the pre-competition versus the competition period. The spectrum of illnesses in Paralympic athletes are different to that than the able-bodied. Most are respiratory, but non-respiratory illnesses including GIT, skin are, are higher. Participation in athletics is a risk factor. I didn't show you those data today, but uh, that is one, one of our findings. Age and gender are not independent predictors. Spinal cord injured athletes and amputees are most at risk of these illnesses. Most of the illnesses are infections. Allergies as well. Um, I didn't show you those data, but that is uh, what we found. That athletes, especially spinal cord injured athletes, may not display the usual symptom patterns, therefore have a high index of suspicion. That Paralympic athletes report late to the doctor and medical staff, and they're not benign. 20% of them are time loss illnesses. 
So when thinking about this, uh, I urge you to think about the following points, which should be really where we're heading with this uh, and where more research is needed. That athletes with impairment might be more vulnerable to illnesses by nature of their underlying impairment. And whether that's an uh, issue to do with the immune system or not, or various different subsystems, that is an area where there needs to be much more research. Detailing the incidence and diagnostics of uh, illnesses are therefore very significant in uh, this population and we will allow for a more tailored prevention and intervention strategies. And this is really, really important because this really is a unique group of athletes where they have self-management and we have typically delayed reporting uh, to the medical caretakers. So if there's really something that you take from this, please go tell your athletes when next you have the opportunity to educate them. If something's wrong, come see me rather sooner than later. And that's the very first important step of prevention. Thank you very much.